Born in the UK, raised in Zimbabwe, embraced Islam in the UK. My father was an atheist, so he's actually a Marxist. And in fact, I got very upset when I saw the women in Egypt. They're being oppressed, it's their husbands forcing them to wear that. I was there with my scarf and there were some, some guys in there who were staring at me. So after I came back from Egypt, I started covering my hair. So I stopped drinking, I stopped eating pork. Allah blessed me with 17 years of marriage to my husband, uh, who is, is uh, sadly returned to Allah, Allah uh, who is, is uh, sadly returned to Allah, Allah Ask yourself, how do I want to die? What state do you want to return to Allah in? Assalamu alaikum, Sister Naima B. Robert. Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are very happy to have you with us. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wonderful to be here. Jazakallah khairan. I want to start with who is Naima B. Robert and can you tell us briefly about your life? I am an alhamdulillah, an award winning author of almost 30 books for children, teens, and adults. I'm also an international speaker and a book coach helping Muslim women to get their story, message, and knowledge out into the world to create a legacy for themselves and their families, inshallah. So born in the UK, raised in Zimbabwe, embraced Islam in the UK, mashallah, uh, while I was at university. Alhamdulillah, here I am today, a global citizen, having traveled the world and lived in Egypt and the UK and back in Zimbabwe. That's me in a nutshell. How was your life in regards to faith? What were you believing in? Well, my mother was born a Christian, like most Africans are Christians. But when she married my father, my father was an atheist. So he's actually a Marxist and didn't believe in God at all. So my mother didn't practice uh, her religion. So I grew up not believing in God until I reached my teenage years. And then when I became a teenager, I started questioning, started asking myself, why am I here? Um, you know, is there a higher power? So all these Christians around me who are praying and singing, have they got anything to, to prove, you know, the reason for why they're doing what they're doing? And I started asking questions when I was about 16, 17. Was there any factor that triggered that surge in you? Yeah. So after growing up in Zimbabwe, and it wasn't until I went to Egypt uh, for a music festival uh, where I was representing my country, when I started to actually notice Islam around me, you know, the mosques and the adhan and the women in hijab. And it's crazy that my view of women in hijab at the time uh, was that they were oppressed. And in fact, I got very upset when I saw the women in Egypt because, you know, I considered myself a feminist and I thought this was wrong. They're being oppressed. It's their husbands forcing them to wear that. You know, why, why, why? And I, I raged for about two or three days, um, angry with, you know, this injustice. So why do they have to dress like that? And we went to one of the events and the lady who was uh, one of the organizers, she was wearing a scarf and we were talking and she just was such a, she was such a light, you know, she was one of those people who, when they smile, you know, you just see this light from them. And I said to her, you are so beautiful. Why do you cover yourself? And she smiled at me and she said, because I want to be judged for what I say and what I do, not what I look like. Completely mind blown. I had never ever heard such an answer. I'd never heard of such a concept. I had never imagined that there was a different way to be a woman. That answer just blew my mind. And I needed to find out what was this Islam? What was this religion that made this woman so strong, so secure, so confident? And I thought there's something there. So that's when I really started embarking on my journey of searching and reading the Quran and finding out what Islam was all about. And I think I embraced Islam maybe about six months later. Before I took my Shahada, I already started changing. So after I came back from Egypt, I started covering my hair. I started dressing modestly. Uh, I stopped going you know, out to parties, etc. I stopped drinking, I stopped eating pork because the way of life made a lot of sense. But I didn't want to submit. Because I thought this Islam is for Arabs, it's for Asians. I'm not an Arab, I'm not an Asian, I'm an African. You know, what have they got to do with me? So 
I went on another quest. I'm going to go to Africa and see for myself. So I went. Wherever you go in the world where there are Muslims, the deen becomes a part of them. They wear it naturally. I saw that the people were comfortable in their Islamic identity. They were African and they were Muslim. It didn't make a difference. You know, they were just Muslim. So from that point, I just said, look, what am I waiting for? You know, what's the problem here? I believe in it. I think it's a good thing. I think this is the right way to live your life. Bismillah, let me do it. And so when I came back from uh, Guinea, that's when I took my Shahada. How was the reaction of your family, your friends, the people around you? That is difficult for family and friends. My father was very upset and he just thought that I was throwing my life away and throwing myself away. And in a way, he felt like he had lost his daughter because he didn't understand why. Why do you need this? You know, why are you going to shut yourself up? Why are you going to constrain yourself with all these rules? Why? He didn't understand. Things were tough with the family for a little while because I think after a year or so, maybe two years, um, the family kind of became comfortable with everything again. And alhamdulillah, my dad is now, you know, a big supporter, mashallah, may Allah guide him. I mean. Uh, after becoming Muslim, was it hard for you to wear hijab at first? And what impact did wearing the hijab have on your daily life? I became very, very comfortable being covered and uncomfortable being, being uncovered. So I remember at one point, I had the big hijabs and the abaya at that point, and I had covered my face a couple of times. But this time I was on the train and I was going home from work. I was there with my scarf and there were some, some guys in there who were staring at me, not in any kind of way, they just were. And I remember thinking they shouldn't be able to see me and stare at me so freely. Like, I don't like that. I don't like that they can just look at me anytime, any way they want. And I think from the next day I started to wear niqab. I'm a very extroverted person and I was a public speaker at school. I was in the drama club and all of that. So that doesn't go away, <laughs> even if you're wearing niqab. And then I was just blessed to be given this incredible opportunity to become an author. It wasn't something that I expected. It wasn't something that I planned for. It literally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gave me this gift and said, do something with this. And so when I started writing children's books, Alhamdulillah, the children's books did very well. And I started being invited into spaces where there were no Muslims. I was the only Muslim. And we went to Andalusia and we booked in for a tour. And the tour was all non-Muslims from all over the world. The number of people that I connected with during that visit, regardless of the fact that my husband and I were the only Muslims on the tour, you know, he's a black African Muslim, you know, there I am with the black clothes and everything. But because we wanted to connect and because of who we are and by the grace of Allah, I believe that so many people's minds were changed that day because they had had their first ever interaction with a Muslim woman in a scarf and it was nothing like they expected it to be. What gaps did Islam fill in your, in your soul, in your heart? The moral compass that Islam gives you is, is largely missing in most Western parts of the world. So even though I grew up in Zimbabwe, we lived quite a Western life. We watched the movies, uh, the TV shows, we listened to the music. So our value system was extremely uh, permissive, right? It was modern Western American values, really. And I think that leaves a big void for a lot of young men and a lot of young women because they actually don't know how to behave. They don't know what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And a lot of the time, they don't know how to respect themselves, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, relationships between men and women. So I really gravitated towards the, the respect for self that Islam gives you as a human being, but especially as a woman and knowing what my value is as a woman and to live in this way that inshallah would protect me from a lot of the vices that were out there. How did you manage to keep your faith? And alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me with 17 years of marriage to my husband, uh, who is, is uh, sadly returned to Allah, Allah irhamu. But we had 17 years of a very stable Islamic marriage. We had a Muslim family. So even though we're both reverts and we don't have Muslim family on either side, we had each other and we had our children and we had a mission. Surrounding yourself with sincere people and trying to live as much as you can an Islamic life 
because there's some people who try to be Muslim living an un-Islamic life. You know, their whole environment is haram. It's hard to stay focused and, and, and committed when all around you, you're being called to other things. What would you say to a girl who wants to take off her hijab? You have to be in charge of your nafs. Not your nafs is in charge of you. You have to be in charge of your nafs and understand that the nafs needs to be kept under control. And then ask yourself, how do I want to die? Because any of us can return to Allah at any time. What state do you want to return to Allah in? In a state of denial, in a state of disobedience, or in a state of humility and submission? And having done the right thing, even when it was hard, even though sometimes you didn't like it. But why did you do it? Because to please Allah for him. So it's a mistake, I think, for sisters to try to rationalize the hijab too much. Of course, there's rational reasons. Of course, there are benefits. Of course, there is a khair. But that's not why we do it. We don't wear the hijab in order to get this or that benefit because that benefit's not guaranteed. What is guaranteed, inshallah, is that Allah will reward the obedience in this life and in the next. How, how do you think women should balance their work and family life? being intentional about what you're living for what is my purpose why did allah create me and what is the work that he's given me to do on this earth so say for example you have children allah's blessed you with a, a marriage he's blessed you with a husband he's blessed you with children you know that those children are amana you know that that husband is amana so don't let anyone tell you that the work that you do for your husband and your children is worth less no matter what the world says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us very, very important roles. And those are roles we cannot afford to not perform in. We can't afford to let those slide. There's some of those roles, you can't outsource them. If you had the chance to speak directly to all the non-Muslims in the world, what would you like to say to them? The world can be a brilliantly beautiful place and it can be a brutally violent, cruel, difficult place. But living a life where you're connected to your creator and living on purpose is that comfort that allows you to make your way through this life. Because none of us are going to have an easy ride all the way, but having faith and knowing the truth and being able to live by the truth is what allows you to make your way through it. Maybe knows a bit about Islam, doesn't know anything about Islam, do what I said before, open your heart with a humble heart, speak to whoever you believe made you and ask him to guide you and then look into it. Yeah, may Allah bless and guide everyone who watches this and who shares it and who inshallah gets some benefit from it. Sister Naima B. Robert, thank you so much for this conversation, for these gems that you, you uh, gave us. May Allah increase your knowledge, may Allah bless your efforts.